In this presentation, we shall discuss about trismus, which refers to the reduced opening of the jaws caused by the spasm of the muscles of mastication. Trismus, the term is derived from the Greek word trismus, which means gnashing as in teeth, refers to restriction of the range of motion of the jaws. Trismus is defined in Tabor's Cyclopedic Medical Dictionary as a tonic contraction of the muscles of mastication. It is a common problem and may interfere with eating, speech, oral hygiene and could alter facial appearance. There is an increased risk of aspiration. The normal range of mouth opening varies from patient to patient within a range of 40 to 60 millimeters. The width of the index finger at the nail bed is between 17 and 19 millimeters. Thus, two fingers breadth would be 40 millimeters up to three fingers breadth which would be 54 to 57 millimeters which is the usual width of opening. There is also gender variation seen with men exhibiting a greater mouth opening. One simple test to determine trismus is the three finger test. Ask the patient to insert three fingers into the mouth. If all three fingers fit between the central incisors, mouth opening is considered functional. If less than three fingers can be inserted, restriction is likely. Kajanjian divided ankylosis of the temporomandibular joint into true and false. The true type of ankylosis was attributed to pathological conditions of the joint and false ankylosis was applied to restrictions of movement resulting from extra articular joint abnormalities and this latter type of ankylosis is what most clinicians know as trismus. Moving on to the pathophysiology of trismus, how does trismus occur? The muscles responsible for mouth closure namely the masseter, temporalis and medial pterygoid muscles which are the muscles of mastication, exert a force 10 times greater than exerted by the muscles that open the mouth. And these include the fourth muscle of mastication, that is the lateral pterygoid, and the hyoid muscles, the suprahyoid muscles, which are the malohyoid and the digastric, both the anterior and posterior belly, and the infrahyoid muscles, which are the sternothyroid, superior belly of homohyoid, and thyrohyoid. These muscles are together are known as guarding muscles. Innovation for the majority of these muscles is provided by the mandibular division of the fifth cranial nerve. The muscle groups that control jaw opening and closure act in antagonism as neurogenic stimulation of one group causes reflex neural inhibition of the other. While the inciting insult may be unilateral, the reflex activated is bilateral. So all these muscles, each of these muscles plays an important role in mastication and when damaged, each can cause limitations in opening. So basically, when any muscle is damaged, a pain reflex may be stimulated. This condition results when muscle fibers endanger pain when they are stretched. This pain causes the muscles to contract, resulting in loss or range of motion. This contraction is truly a reflex. It cannot be controlled by the patient. And in treating this condition, it is important to recall that rapid motion or the use of powerful forces may be self-defeating. Hence, gentle passive motion is efficacious in treating the condition. Now moving on to the etiology of trismus. There are myriad etiologies implicated in the development of trismus. They are broadly classified into intra-articular and extra-articular causes. We shall focus on the extra-articular factors. Infections which can be odontogenic and non-odontogenic. Odontogenic infections include pulpal, periodontal and pericoronal infections. The presence of an oral infection, particularly around an erupting mandibular third molar, is the most common cause for trismus. Several odontogenic infections involving the muscles of mastication are often accompanied by trismus at initial presentation. Non-odontogenic infections that may cause trismus are tonsillitis or peritonsillar abscess. It commonly affects the speech of the patient, resulting in a hot potato voice. Diseases affecting the mandible, such as osteomyelitis, can also lead to trismus. Tetanus, which is an infective disease caused by the inoculation of Clostridium tetany into the tissues of man and animals, can lead to trismus. After a short period of non-specific prodromal symptoms, the first manifestation of trismus is tonic rigidity of the muscles of mastication, followed by stiffness of the face and difficulty in chewing and swallowing. If the muscles of facial expression are involved, the corners of the mouth are drawn back, the lips protruded and the forehead is wrinkled, giving the characteristic appearance of rhesus sardonicus. Treatment consists of the administration of antitoxin, preferably human tetanus immunoglobulin, 
thorough wound debridement, antibiotics, usually penicillin, and sedatives to control muscle rigidity and spasm. Other types of non odontogenic infections which may cause Christmas are a parotid abscess or meningitis, which is the inflammation of the meninges of the brain. The meninges of the brain are the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater. Or there could be an abscess formation in the brain, which can lead to Christmas. The next etiology for Trismus is trauma. Depending upon the type of injury and the direction of the traumatic force, fractures of the mandible may occur in different locations producing mandibular hypermobility such as subcondylar fracture, condylar fracture, coronoid, ramus, angle and fracture of the body of the mandible. Zygomatic arch fracture or a fracture involving the zygomatically maxillary complex can interfere with the movement of the coronoid process limiting the jaw movement. Trismus has also been reported due to the accidental incorporation of foreign bodies because of external traumatic injury. Dental treatment related etiological factors such as post extraction. The extraction of teeth may also cause Trismus as a result of either inflammation involving the muscles of mastication or they could be a direct trauma to the temporomandibular joint. Another common cause of Christmas often seen in general practice is the limited mouth opening that occurs two to five days after a mandibular block has been administered. This is usually attributed to inaccurate positioning of the needle when giving the inferior nerve block. Christmas due to this cause can be protracted and quite severe. Hot packs, stretching exercises using wooden spatulas and reassurance are usually sufficient for this condition. The next subcategory is temporomandibular disorders. They may be divided into extracapsular, that is mainly myofascial and intracapsular problems, which include disc displacement, arthritis, fibrosis, etc. Intracapsular problems are often caused by trauma. Pain upon palpation lateral to the joint capsule is a significant finding. Clicking may indicate anterior disc displacement. Suspicion of TMJ trauma or dislocation should be considered in young patients who have dysphagia and trismus but do not have a serious infectious etiology. The next etiological factor is tumor. Trismus is a potential problem in patients who have a neoplastic disease either primary or metastatic in the epipharyngeal region, parotid gland, jaws or TMJ and thorough clinical and radiographic examination must be performed in order to rule out neoplastic possibilities. Oral submucous fibrosis causes blanching of the mucosa and can affect speech by restricting tongue and soft palate movements. Some drugs are capable of causing trismus as a secondary effect, such as succinylcholine, phenothiazines, and tricyclic antidepressants. Trismus can be seen as an extrapyramidal side effect of metoclopramide, phenothiazines, and other medications. Conditions such as hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia can also result in difficulty in jaw movements. The next common cause of trismus is radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Oral mucosal cells have a high growth rate and are susceptible to the toxic effects of chemotherapy which can lead to stomatitis. The severity of the stomatitis is dose related. Osteoradionecrosis and post-radiation fibrosis are common causes of trismus. Radiotherapy is commonly used to treat squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck region and also regional lymphomas. The primary factor in limiting jaw motion in the irradiated patient or surgery patient is the rapid formation of collagen secondary to radiation damage or surgery. In planning treatment, it is important to recall that immobile joints also suffer degenerative changes. Congenital causes which can lead to trismus are hypertrophy of coronoid and trismus due to camptodactylial syndrome and also periorbin sequence can be seen associated with limited jaw movement. And some miscellaneous causes of trismus are hysteria, which is a psychological cause, and lupus erythematosus, which is an autoimmune disorder characterized by the butterfly rash on the face. So lastly, talking about the management of trismus. Trismus is most commonly self-limited and transient and typically resolves within two weeks. Treatment of trismus is directed at the inciting etiology and is most commonly treated symptomatically. So in acute phases of trismus, the patient is advised to follow a soft diet and avoid solid foods. Symptom-directed interventions include heat therapy, wherein moist hot towels are to be placed on the affected area for about 15 to 20 minutes and repeated every one hour. 
Analgesics such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents can be taken along with muscle relaxants. Analgesics such as acetaminophen about 325 mg 1 to 2 tablets every 4 to 6 hours or ibuprofen 200 mg 1 to 2 tablets every 4 hours. Muscle relaxants may be used in combination with analgesics or alone. Benzodiazepines may also be used such as diazepam about 2 to 5 mg 3 times a day. Patients with post-traumatic and post-operative trismus, especially when persisting longer than one week, may also require stretching exercises. The exercise typically consists of repeated attempts to open the mouth against applied resistance, usually divided into multiple sessions per day. In order to establish normal function, exercises such as neck stretching, chin tuck, massaging of masticatory muscles and other jaw stretching exercises should also be done. A good starting regimen for a stretching exercise is a 777 exercise wherein the patient is instructed to open and close the mouth with assisted opening seven times. Hold the open position to the maximum opening that can be sustained without pain for seven seconds and then they should perform these exercises seven times per day. Trismus may become chronic in the setting of fibrosis or, or ongoing radiotherapy. These cases may benefit from intensive physiotherapy, sometimes utilizing commercially available jaw motion rehabilitation devices or microcurrent therapy, particularly in cases refractory to more conservative approaches. Some authors have also described treatment with xanthine derivatives such as pentoxifilin. An example of a device which allows for the use of passive motion is the Therabyte Jaw Motion Rehabilitation System. So this was all about trismus, its pathophysiology, its etiological factors and management for trismus at various stages. I hope you have liked this presentation. Please do like, share, comment and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.